Muhammad. We have five paper presenters today. Each presenter is given 10 to 15 minutes of presentation time. If any of the presenters could not give a live presentation due to internet problems, we will play back their video, but we hope that the presenter is available for Q&A session later. Without further ado, over to you, Dr. Emma Muhammad. Thank you very much, uh, Wanalia, for that introduction. Welcome, everybody, uh, to the, our first parallel session for Mansion 2021. We are now in session A2 with the theme, Close to My Heart, uh, Health Communications. Okay, with me, um, we have, uh, I think, four or five presenters um, who have already confirmed. Um, and uh, I think uh, what we will do is uh, we will have uh, our paper presenters pre um, given, giving the presentation first. And after that will be a Q&A session at the end of uh, our session. I hope that um, I, I am, I was uh, made to know that uh, two of our presenters will be showing their presentation on um, a video mode. Uh, and I believe, uh, you know, both of uh, these presenters are here as well in the room uh, and uh, just be ready for Q&A session uh, at the end of uh, uh, our session. So 10 minutes will be given uh, for each presenter. Uh, I would also like to announce that uh, we are um, selecting a best presenter at every parallel session. So there will be one uh, recipient of uh, best presenter for session A2. And um, uh, all the best, everybody. Uh, and we will announce the best presenter award at our closing uh, session um, on the third day, on Wednesday. OK, all right. Um, I What I'll do is I will uh, first introduce um, to you all, uh, who's our presenter? Um, so, our first presenter for today is Associate Professor Dr. Aida Mokta from uh, International Islamic University, Malaysia, from Kulia of Islamic Revealed Knowledge and Human Sciences. Um, and uh, she is as well uh, with co um, writer, uh, Perfu Ilter from University of Ofion. Uh, Kochatepe. I'm not sure whether this is pronounced correctly. Um, and uh, Associate Professor Dr. Saida Mota will be doing the presentation. Her area of expertise is advertising ethics, social communication, advertising regulations, and integrated marketing. Uh, so for her presentation is titled um, Public Health Communication Campaign of COVID-19, the case of Malaysia and Turkey. Uh, very interested uh, topic indeed, a comparison study. Um, I hope we are all ready for an exciting um, and uh, engaging session. Uh, we can probably already start since um, Dr. Aida will be doing the presentation via video, yeah? Um, Salam alaikum and uh, good afternoon. My name is Aida Mokta, and I will be presenting on a public health communication campaign of COVID-19, the case of Malaysia and Turkey. And my co-researcher, co-writer was Dr. Bufu Ilte from Turkey. Now, this is how my points will be divided. Um, first, I'll talk about the background, statement of problem, significance of study, research questions, literature review, theoretical framework, findings or discussion, and conclusion. Now, pandemics have influenced our lifestyles and communication campaigns, and the current pandemic coronavirus name officially is COVID-19 was the first identified, was first identified in Wuhan, China in December 2019, and within a span of two months, it traveled across the globe and affected millions of people and it still is affecting millions of people, thus orienting us to a lifestyle of the new norms. And COVID-19 has resulted in over 5 million deaths worldwide as of today. Now, Malaysia and Turkey are in different locations. Uh, Malaysia is in Southeast Asia and Turkey partly in Asia and partly in Europe. So geographically, it's in you know two different locations. They're not exactly neighbors, um, but you know they, it's, it's interesting to see 
the sort of public communication campaigns that they've come up with, right? So both nations are common in that they have large Muslim populations. Uh, Malaysia has 69.8% uh, Muslims and Turkey 99.20% in 2021. So Malaysia and Turkey both have large Muslim populations. And uh, the seriousness or the earnestness of the situation has gained a lot of publicity in the global media. Each country has taken you know, various measures to protect public health, including implementing lockdowns and educating the public about standing standard operating procedures or SOPs. Um, when we compare the background of Turkey and Malaysia, now first, three COVID cases were found in Malaysia on 25th of January 2020 through Chinese tourists who came to Malaysia. And the infections went up after a religious event attended by 16,000 Muslims triggered it and it was called the Tablik Cluster. And the movement control order commenced from 18 March 2020 to 3rd of May 2020 and uh, it banned interstate travel, closed borders. And um, I remember that we had to do our classes, you know, um, from home. And uh, there was a lot of working from home and, and other restrictions came about. Now, Turkey, 11th of March, 2020 was when the first case emerged. And on the 23rd of March, 2020, uh, 11,000 Umrah pilgrims were quarantined yeah, for fear that they were carrying the virus. In March, Turkey banned intercity travel, closed barbershops, malls, and beauty salons. And the first lockdown in Turkey was from 29th of April to 17th of May 2020. Okay, so Malaysia and Turkey, you know, geographically in different places, um, you know, not, not at all neighbors, right? Now, public communication campaigns were conducted to raise awareness in countries about the new norm and uh, getting people, you know, to take precautionary measures to halt the spread of COVID-19. And uh, the content needs to be scrutinized, of course, in terms of its appropriateness. And in this case, we looked at it in terms of social cognitive theory. Of interest to the study is the use of the public health campaign by Malaysia and Turkey, by their own ministries of health, through Twitter messages. Now, the study is important because it contributes to current literature on public health communication in the Malaysian and Turkish context. It helps in theory development, hopefully, and also provides recommendations to academicians, communication practitioners and government officials in both countries. Now, how has the Ministry of Health addressed the knowledge of health risks? So the research questions were based on or framed using social cognitive theory. And uh, these were the elements that were found, yeah, that, that are associated with social cognitive theory. Um, the knowledge of health risks, right? Perceived self-efficacy, um, outcome expectations, right? Uh, health goals that people set for themselves, uh, perceived facilitators, right? Social and structural impediments and the cultural values derived from the gestalt of the Twitter messages by looking at both, you know, the visual as well as the copy. What would, you know, what kind of cultural values came up? So um, when you talk about the literature review, there is nothing similar so far. Right. There's one study comparing the Malaysian and Turkish attention given to COVID-19 from March 2020 to early February 2021. And it was found that both countries had strengths and weaknesses in terms of how they contained COVID-19. And there was a Malaysian study examining the level of acceptance of COVID vaccine, which seems to be a, you know, a favorite, uh, you know, looking at the level of acceptance of the COVID vaccine and based on the findings, the Malaysian public have accepted COVID-19 vaccine and proves that um, social cognitive theory is reflected and people are influenced by the society and the environment around them, especially when making important decisions. And then, of course, the Turkish study that focused on health, health protection and health promotion efforts, which are among the most essential values for human life, revealing the importance and necessity of health communication, which is evolving into a very valuable academic discipline in today's world. Yeah. 
and uh, basically the Ministry of um, Health in Turkey uses various topics and content forms right uh, to transform information through Twitter okay now a study adopted uh, co social cognitive theory but this was in Saudi Arabia again to understand uh, the acceptance of the vaccines in the vaccines in those in the in the country so it found that through social cognitive theory the vaccine rejection rate was high and hence more education on the importance of the vaccine needs to be carried out um, Apparently, there appears to be no studies carried out comparing the communication by the governments of Malaysia and Turkey using social cognitive theory, which this study aims to fill in the gap of. Okay. Um, social cognitive theory can be used to examine health promotion and disease prevention, and this is why it was adopted by this study. And this theory by Bandura 2004 posits a multifaceted causal structure in which self efficacy beliefs operate together with goals, outcome expectations, perceived environmental impediments, facilitators in the regulation of human motivation, behavior, and well-being. And social cognitive theory postulates a core set of determinants, right? The mechanism through which they work and the optimal ways of translating this knowledge into effective health practices. So I took these, um, or we took these core determinants, which encompass knowledge of health risks and benefits of different health practices, perceived self-efficacy, um, you know, uh, the health goals people set for themselves, perceived facilitators, right, uh, social and structural impediments, and we also added cultural values because we felt that, you know, when we compared both, it was important to look into the cultural values aspect as well. So these core determinants were used uh, to guide the creation of a code sheet, right, which was, you know, which was like a code sheet that had definitions. So it was like a code sheet plus code book really put into one. And then each poster um, on each day, right, sometime in March and April in both countries, which were found on the um, uh, Ministry of Health of both countries on their Twitter, right, on their Twitter official Twitter pages were extracted and analyzed, right. So this was a multiple case study that mainly used qualitative content analysis to examine Malaysia and Turkey communication campaigns uh, related to COVID-19 on the official Twitter pages of the Ministries of Health of both both countries and uh, it was a marriage of course between the code book and the code sheet and we use uh, we looked at uh, the communication from these ministries um, from the middle some somewhat in the middle of March 2020 to the end of April 2020 and there were 46 postings from Malaysia and 51 postings from Turkey now some days had two postings so we took both yeah we took both postings, the, the more predominant postings were taken. Now the visuals and copy of the posters were analyzed using qualitative content analysis by two coders and the steps used to carry out the content analysis were deciding on the research questions, we decided on that. Of course, we had to use social cognitive theory to frame the research questions because if not, you know, it, it would be a too wide, selecting the material, building a coding frame, dividing the material into units of coding, trying out the coding frame, evaluating, modifying the coding frame, main analysis and interpreting and presenting the findings and discussions were carried out to ensure the credibility of the findings. Um, and what happened was we, um, of course, the the first posters or first postings, yeah, Twitter postings that were found in March were that were extracted from from somewhat in the middle of March because we wanted to compare at the time when Malaysia was having its uh, about the time when Malaysia was about to have its lockdown and we wanted to compare with what Turkey was going through of course Turkey had like an official lockdown uh, later but we wanted to compare at the at that time you know how was the communication like within the the context 
right? So there were different contexts. Turkey had uh, an official lockdown in April, Malaysia in March, but still Turkey had restrictions earlier, right? Sometime in March already. So this this was what happened. And uh, so uh, it was interesting to see, to compare uh, uh, around about the same time when, you know, the the whole restrictions issue, uh, restrictions were, were happening and how that affected. Um. For the theme knowledge, there were a lot of quotes uh, from Malaysia. The focus was on the statistics of COVID-19 cases and uh, the whole idea of taking precautionary measures. How do you do that right, at work and school? In Turkey, more to how to protect people from COVID-19 uh, in terms of children and the elderly. Um, and other people as well, daily info on COVID-19 cases. So those were the main uh, codes under knowledge. Under perceived self-efficacy, be aware of COVID-19 statistics and levels, Malaysia, right? Society to follow health advice. Turkey, individuals can protect against COVID-19 and can follow SOPs. So how do you beat, right? Uh, COVID-19 is to... Uh, is defined by the codes really. In terms of outcomes for both, more of the physical outcome was um, aimed at when it comes to Malaysia and Turkey, meaning to say that it was more in terms of making sure that um, we protect our health, right, or the people protected their health, uh, stayed healthy, okay, um, follow SOPs, so more physical outcomes were focused on. In terms of goals in Malaysia, being vigilant, right, through the statistics that were shown uh, with regards to the number of cases and the goal of following SOPs. Uh, Turkey practicing precautionary measures and following the 14-day quarantine period were some of the goals that were focused on most. Perceive facilities in Malaysia be aware of the seriousness of the cases. Company management should help break the chain. In Turkey, individuals help themselves and others. And of course, there were the SOPs that helped uh, facilitate the beating COVID-19. Impediments increase COVID-19 cases, of course, would be an obstacle, um, you know, to anybody really who would f possibly feel demotivated. Uh, and then low-income families may not afford uh, healthy foods. So if the advice were healthy foods, then you know, there'll be a problem. Turkey not following SOPs would be an impediment, not adopting prevention and treatment. Cultural values, being responsible of others, right? And Turkey respecting one's right to life, respecting um, individual respect to individual and others' rights to a healthy life were the main cultural values. Findings and discussion, there were similarities and differences in terms of how the posters conveyed uh, these COVID-19 messages between both countries. And the similarities were that uh, both countries' posters mentioned the importance of looking after themselves and what the SOPs were repeatedly mentioned. And the main difference was that Malaysian posters focused more on providing the daily case numbers while the Turkish content was more varied. Findings and discussion again, Hofstede's insights suggest that both um, Malaysia and Turkey are collectivist countries. And of course, there's the whole idea of, you know, there were messages that focused on the family, elderly, children and caring for them, of course. And in conclusion, it's hoped that the study would be able to provide recommendations um, to those in charge yeah, of the communication on COVID to the public in both countries and uh, of course the whole idea of theory development is a big thing and uh, you know providing um, a new study to current literature which hasn't been touched on before thank you thank you thank you very much associate professor dr aida mota for that uh, presentation Wonderful uh, research. Uh, very interested to, to listen to the themes that have emerged uh, from social media from both uh, countries. Um, and uh, 
we'll we'll do the q and a session at the end I, but i can see dr aida there uh, ready to 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 um, you know answer any questions that you might have um but let's uh, proceed with our next uh presenter which will also be yeah okay so our next presenter will be dr hariati abdul karim from university of malaysia sabah on the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities, specifically communication program. Her expertise is in journalism, media and identity, audience studies, and health communication. And uh, her presentation today, entitled COVID-19 Information Overload, How Does It Affect Malaysians Suffering from Anxiety and Depression? Okay, this is a very uh, interesting and very important topic. Um, Obviously, mental health is uh, something that we have we we are focusing on, um, especially with COVID nineteen and what has happened. And um, I'm very interested to listen uh, to Dr. Hariati. So uh, let's um, give a virtual round of applause and uh, pass the floor to Dr. Hariati. Thank Over you. To you. Right. Thank you. Let me. Okay, can anybody see this presentation? All right. Yes. Okay. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, our presentation today is a research that I'm doing with my uh, research partner, uh, Muhammad Hanafi Jumra. Uh, we are doing on um, the problems of information overload of COVID-19 and how is that affecting uh, those suffering from anxiety and depression in Malaysia. Uh, this is actually a qualitative study. Um, in our literature review, there has been a lot of studies that have shown a positive association uh, that uh, overload of information on COVID-19 has great impact on one's psychological well-being. Um, there is also uh, evidence in Hong Kong, for instance, that the prevalence of depression and anxiety was very much higher during the pandemic than before. And we're also seeing that uh, happening in China and in Thailand as well. Um, this is a, a phenomenon that's happening as a consequence to their overexposure of informa uh, information about COVID-19. Um, however, um, we do not dispute that. In fact, uh, uh, what we are just interested to know is that um, a lot of those research did not exactly tell us that if those people are actually those who are already suffering from anxiety and depression, uh, we're not particularly sure because it was not stated there. And so what we would like to do is to contribute further to this study by focusing on those who are already diagnosed with anxiety and depression. Um, uh, previous studies also uses a stimulus organism response model. Uh, it's their theory to explain <clears throat> the, if, uh, the response uh, given, but uh, we would like to know even further <clears throat> how and why it triggers mental health problems and so what we did was <clears throat> an offer um, an additional theory uh, on how people process COVID-19 information. So this is the conceptual definition that we were using for information overload. Um, generally, uh, information overload is a situation where people are receiving too much information, whether it's fake or authentic information, uh, so much so that they just uh, overload, that they just have difficulty in processing the information and uh, deciding and making decision about the information they're getting. The stimulus organism response model is actually, uh, is actually uh, a model that has been already widely used, but we still find relevance uh, in the model in our study. But in addition, we add another theory called information processing theory, in which uh, we find that that may help our questions. Um, because according to Entman in 1989, uh, 
people are actually, there is an embed in them, a cognitive structure, which we, they call a schema. This schema that's already in the mind is the one that help organize people the way they see things, the way they understand things, the way they interpret things. So um, it's actually an organized knowledge about something. So in this respect, what we want to know is what was the schema within the minds of uh, those who are already diagnosed with anxiety and depression uh, as a result of when they are um, overloaded with information about COVID-19. And anxiety, here we need to have a very clear understanding of what anxiety is. And so we are very careful with, uh, we actually draw uh, uh, definitions from Anxiety UK 2021 about what is anxiety. Anxiety is actually a feeling of apprehension and fear, but it become a disorder because it gets out of control. It's normal for people to feel that way, but for those who are suffering from it, it's when it comes and go, and sometimes it comes without within uh, outside their control and so that's where they need help depression or whether it's major or clinical actually is common for us too but it's quite serious in the sense that it's a feeling of worthlessness um, for no reason and if it persists for more than two weeks then it's about it's time that one would need to seek help for that this is how we worked on um, we add here schema theory, information process, in which we want to know more importantly how people um, actually make sense of uh, the information, overload of information that comes to them, and which explains the response uh, that is uh, given out by those uh, suffering from anxiety and depression. Methodologically, it's quite a challenge, actually, because um, it's very interesting. It has been a rewarding experience doing this work. Um, how we go about doing it is that um, we approach the administrator of two support groups, uh, mainly the Malaysian Depression and Anxiety Support Group and the Depression Survivors Malaysia. And we uh, approach the admin. Uh, we had a face-to-face -face, uh, discussion with them online, telling them who we are and what we plan to do. And when they fully understood uh, uh, what we intend to do, they give permission. So they admit us into the FP group. And that's, we post an invitation to all members of these two groups uh, to ask anybody what, if they volunteer to participate in this study. So um, initially, we posted our, uh, our invitation. After two months of doing so, we've, there's only about three who actually came up and indicated they agreed. But when we wanted to do the interview on one withdraw, there's only two left. Then we decide maybe um, there, there is an issue of trust there because uh, we later found out that they're quite afraid when, uh, if somebody outside the group posts something in the FB because they think we are scammers. So we changed our ways. We, what we did, we did, uh, we post a, a survey question, but it's open-ended via Google form. And we got some response from there. We had about 11 people. So in total, we only we manage about 13 individuals, all suffering from anxiety and depression. You see, because those who become members of the FB group must be those who are already diagnosed and undergoing treatment. It cannot be people who think they got anxiety or depression. And for that, we had nine women and four men who share their thoughts with us, ranging from 28 to 46 or so, who participated in the study. And the data that we get, it was all uh, uh, in text. So we analyze the data thematically, and this is what we could find, uh, make out it. <clears throat> so what we found is that among all information of COVID that came to them, 
there are three types that is that they say it's too much for them and uh, there's just too many information of this three kind that is actually can cause a triggering factor for them one they are quite uh, it's a triggering factor for them when they read a lot of news about number of deaths uh, and the daily reports about COVID-19 cases, the brief, uh, the daily press briefing, okay, there it affects them very badly. And the press conference about extension of uh, the Malaysian Control Movement or the MCO. So these three kinds of information, which is overloading them, has caused them who are already suffering from anxiety, depression, various triggers, all kinds of problems. Their panic attack occurs, they felt traumatic, they become more depressed. Um, the level of their worries and fears is, so, is very high. <clears throat> but more importantly, this has led them to see virus uh, COVID as a threat in many dimensions. Okay? And because of this, it's heightened their mental condition, which leads to their response Okay, to protect themselves, they did various ways of avoiding the information. Uh, if they happen to see news about COVID, they just switch to another channel or they watch, uh, they read other news like entertainment, or they even watch cartoon with their children. And some turn off the FB notification about COVID, they don't want to know. Some who are a little stronger, they do read about COVID, but they avoid reading the details. Like they don't want to know how the person died what comorbid they have, and they don't want to know that. Some heighten activities of prayers. Some become germophobic, meaning they become obsessed. You know, every minute they'll sanitize the house. If any one of their family touched the surface of the table, they start scrubbing it because they're so paranoid of the virus. They think it's a, it's going to kill them. And finally, they just choose to ignore the COVID nineteen issues. Just to share with you uh, what they actually said, um, when we asked them about how they feel about uh, you know, the mass inflow of information about COVID, they told us that too much information about intubation, brought in death, escalating number of uh, COVID-19 cases on a daily basis, and what stresses them up is the constant announcement of extension of the MCO affects them very badly. And this is what some of them said. This lady here is a major and persistent depression order disorder suffer. And she says it's just too much news showing how number of deaths getting higher. She gets even more worried and she had to block it. And this second informant is even more, uh, is very pitiful. Because this news, when she it comes in contact with her, she gets panic attack and she starts getting uh, short of breath and it's affecting her so much so that at night she cannot sleep. And her hus when this panic attack came, her husband had trouble. It's a burden to her husband. He had to look after her when she got sick, had to look after the children and all. So yeah, they, 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 there's just too much information of this affects them almost immediately. And this result of that, they saw COVID as actually a threat, a threat to their well-being, a threat to their social freedom, because most of them told us they just need to get out um, of the house most often when they're starting to be affected by their depressive mood and anxiety, they just need to get out. But the fact because of COVID, everybody cannot come out, it makes things worse for them. Okay, here is also a threat to their health, like wearing the mask. Um, this lady here, um, she is uh, suffering from depression. She says symptoms of when her depression comes in is when she starts short of breath. So the mask made her breathless, okay? So she, when she wears the mask, she felt it's difficult to breathe and that may heighten her depression. So she hates wearing the mask, but she still has to wear it because of fear of the threat. For the male informant here, he said he had anxiety disorder. It's a, the moment the, they, they get this kind of information, his anxiety comes up, he had to be referred to a psychiatrist. And the third informant here is a male. 
he he wrote in Malay. He says, uh, saya akan skip maklumat tersebut sebab dia boleh bagi trigger dekat saya. I'll skip those information because it can cause a trigger to me. So it's a way, it's a way for them to protect themselves against their problem. Another threat was like it created like a claustrophobic for them, um, because not only as a result of this they cannot go out. Okay, um, uh, it makes them feel claustrophobic. And here I'd like to share a very. Um, a very honest disclosure by one of our informants. He said, I live under pressure during the pandemic because I feel they had no one who understand my problem, even my family. Last time, I always go back to my hometown to release tension, but now the government disallowed interstate travel. My condition worsened because lots of staff are being laid off by the company. I work with less staff, but workload increased. Even after always, I have to work till late night. I always complain my problems to my family, but I think I'm... But they think I'm being petty. No one in my family understood me. I once thought of swallowing Panadol so I can rest, but I was concerned about the effect. So I decided not to go through with it. I'm at a loss. I need help. So um, this is a very meaningful sharing with us um, from them. Um, so the response that, they, that came out of them against overload of emission was varies. The, they knew they couldn't cope, so many of them changed, divert to other news. The moment they see COVID, they go and what? They switch to other news, sports, entertainment. It's a lot of about entertainment because it keeps their mind away from it. This other informant said they turn off any FB notification about COVID. Uh, one only one informant says she resort to prayers. Okay, she says a lot of prayers for herself for her family. For everyone in Malaysia, as it says, just couldn't cope with it. And the most informants say they avoid reading it in more detail. They don't want to know. It's just too much for them. Some become germophobia uh, as a result of it, is that when they get too much information about the risk of the virus, what it can do to you, the long COVID-19 symptoms, they get scared. So as a prevention, they start become obsessed with cleaning and sanitizing the house. They don't even let the children go out. They don't want people to touch them and whatnot. And finally, uh, there's some just choose to say, okay, we're going to live with COVID-19, but I'm going to ignore anything about COVID-19. But deep inside, they know they cannot avoid facing this information. So this is just one way for them to protect themselves before they have the meltdown. So. To sum up what we could say out of here is that it's actually the way the media coverage of COVID-19, which often use conflict as its news values where the problem lies. Because when they keep coming up with these kind of stories, it sort of creates a situation of doom for informants. They feel that the pandemic already overcome the country's healthcare system. They feel like there's no way out. Um, with the constant reporting of news on the number of deaths and the ever-rising number of cases and the fact that you have to live in a controlled manner. And this information is so it's a lot uh, on a high volume. It creates a frame of thought in their schema that COVID-19 is a real threat, is dangerous, and it kills. So that's sort of like, an, so this become a triggering factor for the anxiety and depressive disorder sufferers. So what we can say here as a conclusion, of, while it's reasonable to say that, I think it's, it's fair to say almost every one of us is actually affected somehow, emotionally, mentally, physically, by the uh, reporting of the pandemic. But we, it's not clear whether it's the difference of schema between people with the normal mental health as opposed to them. Okay. But what we note here is that those who are already suffering from anxiety and depression, they're very much affected by the overload of COVID-19 information that it triggers the problem in them already. Some of them are losing sleep and whatnot. So it's very important for the relevant parties here, like the Ministry of Health in Malaysia and our own media, is that, that they have to be very mindful how to frame this kind of stories about COVID-19 
And we would like to urge that they frame it in a proportionate manner. In other words, um, when you report or disseminate information about COVID-19, it must be balanced between negative and positive angles. Because um, as we could see uh, the, from the very beginning, um, there's a lot of scare tactics in the report. I, the purpose is actually to create awareness and the seriousness of the problem. But the fact is, um, while there are a number of deaths, there are also an, a large number of those who recovered. And this was not um, strongly emphasized in the story. It's a lot of uh, very negative stories. Um, and to some extent, I think we are not aware that this can actually have an impact on those who are already suffering from um, mental health problems such as anxiety and depression. And, that, and with that, I um, conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hayati. I enjoyed listening to the, the findings of your um, study. Uh, it is true. Uh, I think we all have been uh, bombarded with a lot of information um, with COVID-19 and it, it just scares us even for, you know, normal people like us, but more people with, uh, you know, um, experiencing or having to deal with mental health uh, issues. So um, thank you very much uh, for that presentation. Uh, we have our third presenter now. Let's just move on to our third presentation um, by Dr. Siti Azalela Mustafa from University Malaya. And uh, Dr. Uh, Siti Azalela's uh, uh, expertise is media studies, new media and society. And her presentation today uh, is entitled Penggunaan WhatsApp dalam mempromosikan kesihatan mulut dan gigi kanak-kanak analisis terhadap pendapat ibu bapa. Okay, um, so for uh, this presentation, uh, it will be uh, presented uh, via video recording. If technical is ready, we can uh, start playing a video. Saya Siti Izalila Mustafa dari Universiti Malaya okay, akan membentangkan kertas kerja yang bertajuk penggunaan WhatsApp dalam mempromosikan kesihatan gigi kanak-kanak iaitu -kanak, analisis terhadap pendapat ibu bapa. Okey, um, okay, tanpa melengahkan masa saya terus ke slide seterusnya uh, seperti yang sedia maklum Uh, sebenarnya kertas kerja ini dihasilkan juga bersama dengan rakan saya iaitu uh, Nur Zaliza Samiti. Okay. Um, di Malaysia iaitu uh, hampir 73% kanak-kanak di prasekolah uh, mengalami carious uh, gigi dan ada juga yang menderita uh, botol uh, mouse carious. Okay kerosakan gigi yang lebih teruk uh, dan ada uh, tetapi kebimbangan ibu bapa mengenai penjagaan mulut dan pergigian anak-anak mereka uh, didapati semakin menurun uh, memandangkan ibu bapa memainkan peranan penting dalam tun besaran uh, dan perkembangan kanak-kanak Terdapat keperluan untuk interaksi yang mendalam antara uh, ibu bapa atau penjaga dengan kanak-kanak. Okay. So, peranan ibu bapa berfungsi sebagai sumber penting untuk persepsi dan penerimaan anak terhadap sikap, nilai dan tingkah laku. Oleh sebab itu, kemahiran keibubapaan merupakan satu faktor yang penting ataupun kritikal. Uh, dalam era kemajuan media teknologi masa kini ibu bapa atau penjaga mempunyai banyak pilihan dan saluran untuk meningkatkan kemahiran dan pengetahuan dalam kesihatan anak kanak-kanak termasuklah penjagaan mulut dan gigi. Okay, dengan ketersediaan dan fungsi peranti mudah alih yang luas, telefon pintar dan aplikasinya 
telah digunakan untuk menyebarkan maklumat kesihatan termasuk maklumat kesihatan mulut dan gigi kanak-kanak. Beberapa kajian telah membuktikan bahawa terdapat hasil positif pada mereka yang menggunakan aplikasi kesihatan pengurusan diri dan memperkuat dan ini memperkuat kemungkinan penggunaan teknologi uh, dalam strategi promosi kesihatan. Okey. Uh, dan WhatsApp ialah antara aplikasi yang menonjol dan berpotensi untuk digunakan dalam intervensi pendidikan kesihatan. Okey, di Malaysia WhatsApp Uh, merupakan salah satu aplikasi yang banyak digunakan okay, uh, selepas uh, uh, terutama dalam uh, berkaitan dengan aplikasi mobile itu, ataupun aplikasi uh, mudah alih okay, uh, objektif kajian uh, ataupun objektif uh, atas kerja ini adalah untuk mengetahui pendapat ibu bapa terhadap keperkesanan penggunaan WhatsApp dalam menyebarkan mesej kesihatan untuk menyokong penjagaan kesihatan mulut dan gigi anak-anak mereka. Kajian ini menggunakan pendekatan kualitatif. Okay, uh, aplikasi pemesejan sosial iaitu WhatsApp digunakan sebagai media untuk menyebarkan infografik berkaitan penjagaan gigi atau mulut kanak-kanak. Okay. Kumpulan WhatsApp telah dibentuk untuk ibu bapa atau penjaga yang mempunyai anak yang bersekolah di Tadika Perpaduan Taman Sentosa Kampah Perak okay. untuk memudahkan proses intervensi ataupun promosi kesihatan ini. Uh, intervensi pendidikan kesihatan gigi atau mulut kanak-kanak ini melibatkan uh, penyebaran 10 mesej infografik uh, yang terdiri dari uh, 10 mesej yang terdiri daripada 20 infogra infografik dan disampaikan secara berkala iaitu uh, 2 minggu sekali sepanjang Mei hingga Oktober 2019. Okey, uh, dan mesej infografik kenaan uh, berjudul kenali struktur gigi, tabiat baik untuk gigi yang sihat, tabiat yang boleh merosakkan gigi kanak-kanak, plak gigi dan kepentingan mengurus gigi, ubat gigi perflorida dan ubat gigi tanpa florida, kuris gigi, penyakit gusi, sapuan florida, silan pergigian dan maklumat kesihatan pergigian dan Selepas uh, ibu bapa ini uh, selesai menerima infografik daripada manusi WhatsApp, uh, temu bual dilakukan dengan uh, dengan beberapa penjaga uh, dengan menggunakan persembelan mudah. Okey, sampel dipilih dengan bantuan guru tadika uh, perpaduan Taman Sentosa. Ya. Uh, seramai uh, lima uh, orang uh, lima orang penjaga uh, terlibat dalam kajian ini okay. uh, okay. Dan mereka terdiri daripada uh, bangsa uh, India itu seramai tiga orang dan Melayu uh, dua orang ok hasil temu bual yang telah dilakukan uh, kita boleh lihat kepada beberapa tema iaitu apabila uh, berkenaan dengan reaksi okay, uh, ramai uh, semua penjaga yang telah ditemu bual uh, menunjukkan reaksi positif dan menyatakan bahawa melalui infografik yang diterima uh, menerusi WhatsApp uh, mereka memperolehi uh, pengetahuan baru dan maklumat berguna mengenai uh, penjagaan gigi dan mulut kanak-kanak okay. dan rata-rata uh, mereka membaca dan melihat mesej infografik yang 
diterima. Okay. Uh, malah ada yang menunjukkan mesej tersebut kepada anak-anak mereka dan mempraktikkan uh, penjagaan gigi uh, yang ditunjukkan dalam infografik. Okay. Uh, ini boleh dilihat uh, uh, namun eh, okay, uh, ada setengahnya mengatakan uh, walaupun mereka membaca dan melihat mesej yang diterima Uh, tetapi ada yang tidak membaca keseluruhan infografik. Okay. Uh, mereka tidak habis membaca mesej itu kerana terlalu panjang dan ada juga yang menghadapi masalah untuk memahami uh, maklumat yang diterima menerusi uh, maklumat infografik yang diterima menerusi WhatsApp tersebut. Eh, ini boleh dilihat menerusi uh, Jawapan yang diberikan iaitu uh, penjaga A mengatakan bahawa kadang-kadang malas juga baca nak info yang sikit-sikit. Kalau panjang sangat, malas nak baca. Okay. Manakala penjaga D pula menyatakan uh, ia baca. Kadang-kadang tak faham apa yang kita baca. Okay. Uh, so, ini yang dikatakan oleh mereka. Apabila uh, dari aspek perubahan sikap atau amalan dalam penjagaan gigi dan melakukan anak-anak pula uh, majoriti mengatakan bahawa terdapat sedikit perubahan dalam amalan penjagaan gigi atau mulut anak-anak mereka uh, walaupun tidak banyak ini kerana menurut mereka kanak-kanak ini perangai mereka agak sukar untuk disuruh-suruh okay, uh, namun majoriti mereka yang ditemu Paul menyatakan uh, mereka kerap mengingatkan anak-anak mereka untuk uh, menggosok gigi. Okay. Uh, antaranya penjaga tim menyatakan adalah berubah sikit-sikit. Tak banyak. Okay. Biasa mereka bangun pagi sahaja gosok gigi. Masa mandi pun kadang-kadang on and off. Okay. Lepas tu kena tegur lah. Kena selalu benda gosok gigi. Kalau tak gosok, nanti gigi jadi macam ini. Eh, macam yang ditunjukkan dalam infografik. Ah, maksudnya, manakala uh, penjaga people menyatakan sebelum ini anak saya nak tidur tu jaranglah gosok gigi. Tapi lepas tengok gambar gigi, uh, rajin sikit lah. Adalah perubahan. Okay. Uh, namun apabila di... Uh, uh, Kaitan dengan kesuaian WhatsApp sebagai media penyampaian bagi pendidikan kesihatan, rata-rata penjaga menyatakan bahawa cara begini iaitu penyampaian menerusi WhatsApp kurang sesuai kerana ada maklumat yang disampaikan tidak difahami mereka. Ha, ini uh, kerana ada infografik yang menggunakan jargon yeah, iaitu bahasa yang khusus digunakan dalam bidang tertentu. Okay. Uh, well, antaranya ada yang mengatakan bahawa Kadang kita pun tak faham apa maksudnya. Kadang kita tengok apa maksudnya, apa tujuannya, kita tak faham. Okay, kita seronok kita, uh, dapat info tapi kadang kurang faham. Itu antara yang dinyatakan oleh salah seorang uh, pen, penjaga atau ibu bapa. Lah. Okay. Uh, mereka lebih gemar uh, maklumat sebegini ataupun pendidik kesihatan disampaikan secara komunikasi dua hala ataupun komunikasi secara bersemuka. Okey, uh, a ini juga boleh dilihat menerusi jawapan mereka. Uh, kalau cakap face to face, kalau cakap direct begini kita boleh faham. Okey. Uh, ada ada yang menyatakan lebih suka bersemuka, boleh dengar dan tanya kalau tak faham. Kalau dalam WhatsApp kita tengok sahaja. Kalau tak faham malas nak tanya. Dan nak tanya pun tak faham sebenarnya. Ha, itu ya jawapan yang diberikan oleh penjaga C. Uh, Manakala penjaga E pun mengatakan, entahlah saya tak senang nak baca WhatsApp lah. Ha, itulah. So selain secara bersemuka mereka juga mengatakan bahawa maklumat uh, 
ataupun uh, pendidikan kesihatan ini mungkin lebih sesuai disampaikan uh, dalam bentuk video dan gambar okay? dengan menggunakan animasi ataupun kartun okay? uh, sebab uh, menurut mereka okay, seperti penjaga si mengatakan kalau video pun anak-anak boleh tengok dan tunjuk pada anak-anak mereka pun faham kalau baca mereka kurang faham Okay, um, kalau uh, salah seorang lagi penjaga mengatakan bentuk mereka bentuk kartun mereka suka lah tengok macam upin upin ada satu episod tentang gigi. Uh, so itu antara uh, jawapan yang diberikan oleh uh, anak uh, oleh mereka. Okay, uh, sebenarnya um, menusi WhatsApp ini uh, menurut message yang disampaikan. Eh, mereka juga sebenarnya menyatakan uh, setelah mesej atau mereka menerima mesej infografik tersebut, uh, mereka tidak bertanya apa-apa kepada uh, moderator. Okay? Uh, walaupun ada infografik yang tidak difahami. Uh, sebab itu uh, ada yang menyatakan uh, sejarah bersebuka adalah lebih baik uh, berbanding uh, menerusi uh, WhatsApp ini. Dan selain itu, uh, selain media sosial, mereka juga mengatakan mesej juga sesuai disampaikan dalam bentuk poster uh, dengan menggunakan gambar berwarna dan diletakkan di sekolah. Okay. Uh, so, keseluruhannya dapatan kajian menunjukkan bahawa uh, intervensi pendidikan kesihatan dikatakan sesuai okay, untuk disebabkan menerusi WhatsApp. Malah terdapat perubahan dalam malam penjagaan gigi atau mulut dalam kalangan anak-anak mereka. Namun, tiada uh, komunikasi atau perbincangan antara moderator dengan penjaga dan sesama penjaga dalam kumpulan WhatsApp yang dibetul. Uh, walaupun uh, banyak kajian yang menyatakan bahawa komunikasi dua hala dapat ditingkatkan antara pegawai kesihatan dengan kalayaknya melalui Uh, media sosial uh, atau aplikasi pemesej yang segera seperti WhatsApp. Namun tidak dinafikan bahawa kebanyakan individu lebih cenderung untuk menggunakan maklumat daripada menyumbang kepada pertukaran atau komunikasi dua hala. Okay. Uh, infografik pula uh, sering digunakan dalam usaha memudahkan penyampaian mesej bagi topik-topik yang kompleks seperti pendidikan kesihatan ya, bagi memudahkan orang ramai memahami. Okay. Malah ini sering digunakan setelah uh, media sosial ataupun uh, aplikasi mudah alih menjadi semakin popular bila dapat menarik perhatian penerimanya dan mereka boleh mem, uh, semakin popular dan banyak digunakan oleh orang ramai. Namun infografik uh, dikatakan uh, boleh dikatakan berjaya apabila ia dapat menarik perhatian penerima dan mereka memahami maklumat yang dipersembahkan. Okey, kerana infografik sebenarnya menjadi jambatan antara orang awam dengan uh, profesional kesihatan. Oleh sebab itu, uh, ada kajian yang mencadangkan pakar mereka media sosial dan pakar pendidikan kesihatan bekerjasama untuk menghasilkan infografik yang jelas dan lebih baik bagi keseluruhan perikaan infografik berkenaan. Termasuk, ini termasuklah dari segi uh, bahasa yang digunakan okay, supaya ia lebih mudah difahami oleh orang awam. Uh, ini menunjukkan bahawa perikaan grafik, infografik perlu mempertimbangkan keperluan medium atau platform serta khalayak sasarannya. Okey. Malah moderator perlu sebenarnya memainkan peranan aktif dalam mengendalikan kumpulan WhatsApp dalam menggalakkan perbincangan dan komunikasi dua hala dengan kalayak sasaran. Oleh itu keperluan untuk moderator uh, untuk menjawab soalan dan gangguan berterusan oleh ahli kumpulan mewakili batasan penting yang perlu dipertimbangkan semasa menambah baik strategi penyampaian uh, mesej ataupun uh, intervensi pendidikan kesihatan. Okey, uh, okay, ini saja pembentangan saya pada kali ini. Sekian.
Terima kasih. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Siti Izelila, for that presentation. Um, clearly, uh, you know, promote health promotion can also be at a very personal uh, social media um, platform such as WhatsApp. And uh, through her study, she found that uh, you know it it has some impact on behavioral change. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, and uh, next, we are. Um, we are calling our last presenter for uh, for this session, uh, Mr. Uh, Wei Lu Zhu, uh, for our PhD candidate here uh, at Mansion in Sikabasa and Malaysia, and his area of expertise is in journalism, and uh, uh, he will be presenting a paper entitled "A Meta Analysis for News Framing Research." on health report yeah um Weilun, are you ready if you are um like to uh invite you and please give a virtual round of applause to mr Weilun. the air is yours okay. okay thank you doctor can you hear my voice yes oh, okay let me share my screen okay could you see my slides it's opening now. Yes. Yes. Now. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Thanks for uh, thanks for listening. And my name is Jiwei Lun. I'm PhD student of UKM, and my title is a uh, meta analysis for news framing research on health reports from 2020 to 2021, and I mainly explain it through the five parts. The, the five parts. And in the first part, public health issues are often followed by and discussed by the media, and the, me and the mass media is biased towards specific news framing to construct public health discourse can primarily intervene and influence the public's perception, attitude, and behavior on specific health issues. Accordingly, news framing has gradually become a prominent concept in, uh, in health communication research. However, there is no currently or almost no research that evaluates the scopes and the paradigm of framing research on health issues in the last two years. Accordingly, this research aims to conduct a quantitative synthesis and meta-analysis of framing research on health issues from 2020 to 2021 from the, public, uh, from the published information research scope paradigm to evaluate the main uh, characteristic, characteristics and deficiencies in this field and elaborate on significant relationships between these uh, characteristics. Sorry. And next, uh, next part is uh, liter literature review. Uh, Frame can emphasize and highlight some bits of information about an A term that is su the subject of a communication, thereby evaluating them in salience. According to Gunther Edel, framing research on health issues can be divided into communication orientation and psychology orientation. For communication orientation, it mainly refers to uh, the, different, the differentiated health discourse in health issues constructed through specific news framing. And news framing is requestioned by the media in health issues, which, con uh, which contributes to distinct social constructions of the events themselves. In this field, uh, related research has conducted empirical research on the health communication practice of media from different topics and framing typology. For example, Wang and Mao uses a generally frame and combine the theory of risk society when starting the coordinating issue, explaining that the consequence, the, the consequence frame and the uh, treat, treat, treatment re responsibility frame cannot only help the further uh, deterioration of risk, but also effectively prevents the risk from turning into a disaster. And in addition, John claims that when the New York Times constructs Chinese lockdown issues, it uses more politically charged uh, responsibility frames, which makes the lockdown issue politically, uh, which makes the lockdown issue uh, appear more politicized. Thus, research in the communication orientation confirms that different, uh, different framing types are applied to specific topic, topics of health issues. 
constructing differentiated uh, health discourses. And next, about framing, framing effect of health issues. Uh, psychological orientation mainly explores and measures the effect of new framing, that is, the effect of a specific framing on the public cognition, attitude, and behavior towards health issues. Competing frame refers to the frame in uh, refers to the framing in which the strategy and its effect are opposite, including positive and negative frames or gain and loss frames. Studies have shown that diametrically opposed framing has a differential impact on public attitudes. For example, when studying the effect of the pandemic on self-care behavior, uh, Gantiwa et al. contended that game frame health messages increase intention to adopt self-care behaviors and were judged to be stronger. However, loss frame increased risk perception and negative frames can promote the public's obesity risk perception more than positive frames. And affected by the loss of frames, the public is, is, more, risk, is more risk averse. Compared with uh, competing frames, other framing types are not significant in psychology orientation. So in summary, new framing, a means of media presentation and principles of interpretation, can construct specific health discourse and effectively shape public attitudes. However, there is no research to systematically summarize the research orientation, research topic, and framing, to and framing typology of framing research on health issues in the past two years. Secondly, little is known about the cross-relationship between research orientation, framing typology, and the research topic. Based on this, this research proposes the following research questions. What are, the, what are the main research orientation, research, uh, research topic, and, research, uh, and framing typology regarding framing research on health issues? Is there a significant relationship between research orientation, research topic, and framing typology regarding framing research on health issues? And next is methodology. For data collection, this research, uh, this research mainly selects the documents in the Web of Science and Scopus citation uh, database from 2020 to 2021 as the research samples. In the end, this research collects a total of, uh, 80, of 86 documents about framing research on health issues. So the specific uh, collection and screen process is shown in figure one. And for coding, this research mainly uh, encodes relevant reports, uh, relevant samples from published, published information, research scope, and research paradigm. Uh, research scope mainly comprises the nation of risk uh, location, research orientation, research topic, and framing typology. And research paradigm mainly includes quantitative, qualitative, and mixed paradigms. And specific coding definition is shown as in table one. Uh, two, co uh, two coders complete the coding work of this study, and COPPA statistics is utilized to calculate the coding reliability coefficient of each category to test the, the intercoder reliability. And for data analysis, first of all, this research uses charts and tables to count the frequency and percentage of the corresponding literature from the three categories of, public, of uh, published information, research scope, and research paradigm. Secondly, the chi-square test is utilized to measure the significant relationship between authors, nation, and nation of research location, as well as the significant relationship among research orientation, research topic, and framing typology, because the related concepts involved in this study are all categorical variables. And finally, the data results of obtained are discussed in detail. Uh, due to the uh, time constraints, I will not explain the results of scientific data analysis in detail. And for next section for discussion, first of all, the results of framing research on health issues are mainly published in health same journals. Scholars and academic institutions in developed countries, especially the United States, have the highest degree of prominence in this field, confirming the relative absence of developing countries in framing research on health issues. Second, as regards the research scope and the research paradigm, this field is biased towards communication orientation and focuses on infectious disease, especially COVID-19. Current scholars mainly focus on various health issues in the United States and their, and their uh, analytical 
are often limited to a single country, lacking a transnational cooperation between uh, different countries or regions. And quantitative research is the most popular paradigm, especially the quantitative content analysis and the experiment method. In addition, research in this field pays relatively little attention to how specific framing of facts, public perception, and response to the health crisis. In other words, the psychological orientation is less, orienta is, is less attention than the communication orientation. Finally, this study also confirms that framing typology can be affected by specific research topics. And for this research, this, uh, this study still has some certain limitations. To prove the quality of an, uh, of an object, this study only selects journal articles and conference papers in uh, Web of Science and Scarborough as, um, as research samples. On the basis of ensuring the equality of literature research, uh, future review research can combine more data sources, such as books and, and dissertations, thesis, to expand the simple size and more comprehensively uh, char characterize and summarize the research trend of this field. Okay, that's all. Thanks, doctor. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Weilun, for that presentation uh, entitled A Meta Analysis for New Streaming Research on Health Reports. Uh, we have now come to uh, the uh, QA session um for uh, this parallel session on health communications and i'm sure all of you uh, who've uh, listened to all the four presentations today um have some questions that they, you want to address uh, you want to um, pose to the presenters um may i just uh, invite uh, anyone who are interested to ask question um, to uh, probably um, put up your hand, uh, at least the symbol of uh, putting up the hand. Um, and um, I will give you the uh, chance to address. Uh, and please just uh, introduce yourself, where you're from, um, where, who, uh, you know, are you addressing the questions to? And um, uh, you, can, you can post the question uh, to, the, to the presenter. Um, for those who uh, are having connection uh, problems, if you still want to ask questions, can you also type in the chat box? I can pick up you know, uh, your questions from the chat box as well. So you have two modes of uh, you know, the Q&A uh, um, uh, channels of communication that you can do. So anybody um, who would like uh, can either ask the question verbally straight away and, or type in the chat box. I hope all the presenters uh, are ready um, to answer the questions. Uh, let me just open the floor for the Q&A session. So if uh, I can invite Dr. Aida, uh, Dr. Haryati, and uh, Dr. Siti Azalila, and as well as Dwi Lun to switch on your cameras so that uh, everybody can see you all um, when we do the Q&A session. Anybody uh, has any questions? I'm going through the list of um, audience that we have in this session. Uh, there is nobody Show of hands, anyone? Uh, maybe I can start. <laughs> um, I am, uh, well, I have uh, you know, several questions. If I just uh, address the first one to Dr. Uh, Siti Izalila, I'm, I'm interested because you are, you, you, you've mentioned in your findings that um, in infographics can help uh, with communicating uh, through WhatsApp uh, for um, oral health among children. Um, I just wanted to ask, do you know like specific uh, recommendations that you could give from your uh, from your findings on the type of uh, you know infographics or, or the 
the, the things that should be highlighted or you know put emphasis on the infographics itself to to increase that motivation for parents um yeah so maybe uh Dr. Siti Izalila, if you want to uh, share, if you do have some answers to that, I'm just curious to know. I think she is having an internet problem. I think she is not in the room for right now. Oh, she's not in the room right now. Uh -uh. Okay. I think so. she is because she has been uh, informing that her internet is uh, sometimes not stable. Okay, all right then. Um, I'll ask the question again uh, if she comes back. Uh, Alia, just let me know if, if she comes back so I can repeat the question to her. Uh, right. Anybody else uh, want to ask any question? Please don't be silent. <laughs> I hope you were listening to the presentation. Very interesting, uh, you know, presentations related to uh, you know health and how um, we should uh, be more strategic in communicating about health whether it's COVID-19 uh, we or... have from Latif Lai over here uh, okay Dr. Latif um, Dr. Latif yes uh, would you like to ask your question and then after that we can pass to Dr. Aini yeah, um, thank you Dr. Emma. Um, my, my question is it's not a question I'm just asking the opinion for both Dr. Aida and Dr. Hayati, because uh, both are um, talking about um, message designs or message framing by, by the um, local journalists. And Dr. Aida has the comparative study between Malaysia and um, Turkey. Both are very interesting um, studies. So are you both um, suggesting or implying that our um, journalists need to reschool, I mean, need to be retrained in terms of how are they going to um, framing the, the stories of um, pandemic, uh, especially um, when we are anticipating that there will be um, a future pandemic. That's all, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Latte for that question. So I guess uh, either Dr. Aida or Dr. Hariati, would you like to uh, address the, the question by Dr. Latif? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty okay with that, if that's okay. Uh, thank you so much. Latif, Dr. Latif is a, fr a good friend. <laughs> uh, and the thing is, thank you so much for the question. Um, I, yeah, when I was coding through the different uh, postings, I realized that when I compared it to Turkey, Turkey had a greater variety and I speak in terms of me, um, the postings having an effect on me, isn't it right? Because I'm not really uh, testing it out on an audience, you know, on a large audience and seeing the effects there, but how they affected me as I was looking through them and I was coding them as well, was that they, you know, we, we lack variety in our communication, I realized, compared to Turkey. Um, is that a good thing or bad thing? Well, we like to emphasize on, on numbers. It seems like we like to report COVID cases a lot of the time. And I feel that as a person, you know, and uh, until now, isn't it, we've been looking forward to the COVID cases. However, have we uh, I think perhaps the government has to go and and uh, create a more multi-dimensional multi uh, message content rather than uh, being focused on only the numbers themselves because it can be quite depressing. And there are many issues with regards to COVID other than the numbers themselves that we could also um, look at, isn't it, right? So, and one thing about Turkey was that it focused on the government being a hero, uh, which I thought was very interesting. Um, it's the nationalistic uh, spirit of it that came out a lot through its uh, messages. Uh, I felt that perhaps our messages, you know, uh, could have more uh, variety really to make it even more effective. It's not that it's less effective, uh, or it's not effective at all, but to make it more effective and, and more 
uh, focused on, you know, the whole idea of depression coming in, like, you know, we were looking at, of course, uh, the other researcher talking about that and, and how it affects, you know, mental health in a big way. I mean, there are many issues that could also have been touched on and we didn't touch on a lot of it. So, you know, I felt it could just be improved a bit. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Taida. Uh, Dr. Hariati, would you like to um, respond? Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Latif. Um, yeah, absolutely. I really think um, our journalists, not to say reschool, I think they need to um, be retrained on health journalism. As it's journalism, it's not just COVID, um, but I would take the case of COVID-19. Um, it's uh, fairly imbalanced the way they've been doing it because yes, initially they have to report what actually happened. And that is we were having a problem um, that led to us having a lockdown on, um, in March, 2020. But then as we goes along, we noticed that the reporting was a lot of fear, um, fear approach, you know, a lot of scaring and, um, they highlighted too much a lot on the negative uh, aspect of the uh, pandemic. And if, uh, when I had a good look at the data, uh, the statistical data from MOH, actually the number of those recovered during that time was also a lot higher than those who died. But that was not actually the angle of the story uh, of a, a lot of the coverage of COVID-19. So I think that was one of the reason why my informants had this kind of fear and um, they highlighted a lot about the intubation. Now intubation is a very negative, dirty word, when in actual fact, intubation doesn't mean it's the end of your life. A lot of times doctors have to use intubation because it's the best way to actually treat uh, those, uh, uh, those who have uh, lung infection, which is very bad, seriously, because this only, they resort to this when, when you don't respond to oral. So they had to intubate it. So yes, you will be put to sleep for a period of time. And um, like my father was 76, he was intubated. He got up on the third day when he's supposed to be put to sleep on seven. Um, it's just a mad, so the kind of uh, scared reporting is what scares a lot of people. And it shows that they don't really understand um, what it means. That's one. So secondly, um, they need to be uh, educated about the audience effect of their reporting of COVID-19. And I, another issue that I find um, very troubling with the way they report health journalism is that um, there's a lot of use of medical terms without explaining what it is. Um, I came across a news that they talk about the vaccine. You want to persuade people to take COVID-19 vaccine. But you see, they were using terms like breakthrough infection rates uh, is successful for 1.30 people per 100 a week. Do anybody understand that? Do you understand that? How do you get people to have a positive change towards acceptance of this vaccine if this is the way you report? You, you see what I mean? I mean, this is actually put out for general reading, but the terms uh, uh, the stories are laden with medical terms, which is not, in which people do not understand. Uh, in the end, what people understand more is the, the fact uh, it's framed in a conflict frame for those stories. So I believe that they really need to be um, retrained about health journalism. There's a way of writing health uh, uh, stories in which the purpose is not to scare actually, um, when we talk about health problems, it's actually intended to educate the public about health care, health promotion, health prevention. That is what it's supposed to be. But I don't, I'm not seeing that in a lot of our stories. They talk about variant of concern, variant of interest, but they don't tell the public what is that and why people should be concerned about VOI, VOC. You see, it's just laden with medical terms with no meaning. So <clears throat> yes, I honestly feel there is a need for a workshop to train journalists about uh, health journalism. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Hayati, for that uh, wonderful explanation. Um, so Dr. Taida has uh, uh, has shared her concern about the variety of reporting uh, on COVID-19 uh, on our Malaysian media. And uh, Dr. Hayati uh, has highlighted that there, there, there might be, uh, you know, um, the need for us to retrain uh, our reporters um, to focus more on the positive light or at least have a balance, um, you know, reporting uh, and not just highlighting on the negative things which have, uh, you know, effect on mental health of our audiences. Um, and, uh, and, and, and this is something that uh, I don't know whether my news writing students are in this, uh, in this, in this session, but this is something that, you know, reporters are trained to focus on the angle that, it, that, that can, can generate the negative part because that's the drama of it. That's the, you know, that's the focus of it. It has that news value um, as opposed to the positive news, right? So compared to the, the positive news, reporters often take the negative angle as a news, uh, news value. So I do agree. I mean, I think uh, there is a need to retrain uh, journalists to look at other creative ways, variety uh, to report um, health uh, and health issues uh, in the media. So thank you very much, uh, both Dr. Aida and Dr. Hayati for that. Um, Dr. Aini has raised her hand. Maybe Dr. Aini, you have a question. Um, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Um, but before I go to my question, I'm just going to say that um, the discussion that we had just now, especially on the framing um, on science, no, on health journalism, um, the you know the balance between framing and negative, uh, negative and positive framing is definitely the in thing that we need to highlight. I think rather than looking at the science, I mean the sorry, I mean, the journalists also need to look at the KKM, the MOH people. They also need to highlight the right thing rather than you know highlighting all the bad stuff. So yeah, uh, we also need to include those people. Anyone from MOH should be joining us and you know get into the health communication um, discussion. Anyway, my question is for Dr. Hariati. Um, good research that you've done there. I think on, uh, on the on the sorry on the uh, COVID nineteen studies. Uh, just a quick question because I remember that you said that um, when you try to get your respondents, one of the reason why the numbers is slow because they there are some trust issues um when you were trying to employ the respondents so i was thinking um did you do ethical approval um when conducting the study and does that actually you know um somehow influence them to take up to uptake the research or that does not help at all okay we took every care about the ethics consideration in, in many ways. Um, the first thing is that um, we, uh, we actually guaranteed them confidentiality of their identity. They can talk to us without the camera on. Um, that's one. We already explained that to the administrator, um, who is actually the gatekeeper, to the uh, to the group, they we uh, they did express their concern. They say, "What if? What are you going to do if in the middle of the interview they trigger? I mean, some of your questions you may trigger. What are you going to do?" So we explained to them the steps that we had taken. Um, a, a lot of the questions we asked was not prodding actually. What we did before we approached them, we already read the post. We already get to know them uh, they, uh, we don't it's not about who they are but uh, what is in their what's in their mind how they think how they feel so we, we actually already got to know them earlier we sense that they're actually very vulnerable uh, they're very vulnerable and they always tell us uh, they, they always post about what makes them upset under what condition they are very uh, they, 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 the press comes for round. So we're very careful about how to ask. So when we finally uh, get to approaching them, uh, we were very careful with the questions. We actually, they like to talk. They like people listening to them. So our question is like that. Can you share us how you feel? Can you uh, 
do you remember uh, how you feel when I, so it's that kind of question so that's why we get more people to share because they just want someone to listen because that was where their problems lies is that um, they don't have people don't want don't care about them and then they even the family thinks they're petty they, they, there's a lot of people who don't understand what they're going through so that's what what we are trying to do was so our question we structured was a lot of them sharing with us that's why we got them to talk but the trouble what trust was not it's not about us it's because previously there were there were some dishonest people who went into their the post uh, fb group and uh they are actually scammers scammers uh so that's how they got uh what you call once beaten twice shy but when they saw we were very persistent, in fact, we, we actually disclosed who we are. Uh, uh, we were very transparent. It's that's how they gain confidence. And um, they, some of them actually volunteered to share the information because this is voluntary. Well, most are not voluntary, then we do not force them. So, um, and that is how we came to that. But uh, I wouldn't say this research is representative of all, but it does give us some bit of understanding about how they are, uh, how the in, uh, inflow of, um, the mass inflow of co negative COVID-19 news is affecting them, okay? They're already very vulnerable. Uh, they're more health conscious than all of us, but yeah, so when the constant news about broad in debt, intubation and whatnot, that's often magnified, that triggers them. So we have to actually be very careful when we want to report news and we must know what does the public has the right to know. That is what we have to be very careful because I'm telling you, even normal people, if you expose yourself for two years, this kind of story eventually it gets to them. So we have to be extremely careful. That's what I'm saying. Uh, yes, we took every uh, care when we deal with them. They are vulnerable groups. So we are just very grateful that all came to us voluntarily. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hayati. Um, I can totally relate to that uh, because one of my PhD students is also um, trying to uh, get access or ethical approval to interview um, uh, patients, mental health patients. Um, and try to talk to them about, you know, their own experiences and how they use social media as, uh, you know, um, an outlet to communicate about their mental health and depression. Um, and it's it's not easy to get ethical approval because we are dealing with uh, uh, vulnerable groups. But I understand, um, you know, some of the concerns um, uh, are are that maybe our questions can trigger, uh, you know, their um, their depression. Uh, or their mental health, uh, you know, uh, issues. So there are some ethical issues around that. And um, I was glad to uh, listen uh, to Dr. Hayati when she said that she got to know the, the respondents first, uh, you know, sort of have that um, communications before and getting to know uh, them at the personal level before uh, doing the interview itself. So uh, that that must have helped, uh, you know, um, calm them down before um, for having a conversation. And I, I like that, uh, you know, um, you have also uh, changed the approach of the interview to be more of, uh, you know, rather than getting them to tell their story. So it's it's more, you know, because they like to share. Uh, mm -hmm. So that 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 must have helped a lot as well in in that interview. Okay. Um, so do we have any other questions? Dr. Siti Izalila, are you here? Because there are questions for you in the chat box. Um, can I just check if Dr. Siti Izalila is here? I believe she's also haven't in, in the room yet. Mm. Okay, um, sorry, Gui. Uh, mm. <laughs> Dr. Izalila is not here. So I um, won't be able to uh, address your question at this point. Um, oh, thank you very much for the <laughs> for the comment. Uh, 
Um, and uh, yeah, any other questions? Thank you very much, Burfu, for that uh, comment. Uh, any other questions from the floor? To any of our presenters, the three of our presenters were here. Or any comments? I would love to have uh, you know more engaging discussions um, uh, that can you know result to few future uh, probably collaborations or expanding on the research that we have listened today. Uh, I mean, this is this is uh, a wonderful um, you know outlet for us to discuss further uh, future opportunities to work together or to to collaborate for other future research. Please, uh, you know, anyone, uh, I know whoever is in this session are all very interested with health communications. Um, I see familiar faces, familiar names. Um, so yeah, if anyone would like to uh, extend uh, or share or comment, I would, uh, yeah, I would, I would open the floor for that. But Taini, do you still want to this, your hands are still raised there. I'm not sure whether you are good. <laughs> if you have any other comments. Um, Dr. Jason, Dr. Anis, would you, do you have any um, probably um, questions or that you'd like to ask? Uh, thank you, Dr. Emma, and thank you all the presenters. Uh, I basically... put you on the spot. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Actually, I don't have any questions to the presenters because uh, you know they have done a fantastic job to me, at least. Uh, especially uh, Dr. Hayati's research uh, on information uh, overload, because currently uh, one of my master's students uh, is doing information overload research, but uh, from a quantitative perspective. So Dr. Hayati is doing from a qualitative perspective. So uh, yeah, so I, I gained some insights uh, um, into that. So thank you very much for sharing, uh, you know, your wonderful research with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jason. Uh, anyone else? Dr. Anis, would you like to? Oh, I joined quite late just now. Uh in finishing my session. So uh, I don't have anything to say, but um, yeah, thank you for sharing uh, all of the findings of um, your research to all presenters. Yeah, uh, thank you, Datanis. Uh, do we have anybody else who would like to uh, ask any questions? If not, um, let me just uh, conclude the session by saying thank you very much uh, to all presenters who have presented their uh, research findings, uh, as well as uh, shared with us some knowledge, some insights, uh, you know, on, on the topic of uh, your respective um, studies. It's very interesting indeed. And I'm always, always excited to learn new things and, um, you know, being in the session where we, we listen to uh, research findings, um, especially related to health communication, always, uh, you know, excites me. And I've learned a lot as well, listening to uh, all of your presentations today. So thank you very much um, to all of uh, our presenters, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Aida Mokhtar, Dr. Hayati Abdul Karim, um, Dr. Siti Ezalila, Mustafa, as well as uh, Weilun, Juwelun, uh, for a wonderful uh, sharing session today. Um, thank you very much, everybody, uh, all the audience uh, in this uh, parallel session for health communication. Um, I shall um, end uh, our parallel session for this afternoon. Uh, we will go on uh, a break um, from, uh, yeah, up till 4.05. And 4.05, we will come back to the... Uh, same link on the main room where we will continue with parallel session B um, and uh, you all can select which room um, that you all want to uh, participate or sit in. Okay, thank you very much everybody again and I'll see you guys uh, in the next parallel session. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>